Do you experience much pushback or much uh, conflict from religious people who don't like the fact that you describe things in that way that, that didn't need an intelligent force yeah. or an intelligent creator to, to well, exist? It's, it, it's an interesting question because um, the biological community, people like Richard Dawkins and the like, I think have really borne the brunt of the religious pushback because they're dealing directly with the phenomena of life and that's the precious commodity that somehow we want to be sacred and therefore our religious sensibility will push back on it just being the mindless laws of physics and evolution yielding you know life on planet earth they haven't pushed as hard on the quantum physicists and the cosmologists as they have on the biologists. But I have had conversations. Many of them are, 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 are respectful as opposed to antagonistic, where the view is that I am wrongheaded, that mm. I am missing the point. And some of these religious folks are fantastically accomplished scientists. That's weird. Yeah, I mean, I went to a, a gathering I think I can talk about now. It was closed door gathering. You weren't meant to describe. Hope you it. don't get sued by this yeah, one. Yeah, that's right. I'm really opening myself <laughs> here. Uh, and um, and uh, I thought it, it was it was science. It was called science and the spiritual quest, and it was a bunch of scientists that were being brought together. And I thought it was going to be an interesting, but ultimately one note meeting. I thought everybody's going to basically say the same thing. There could be a god. There's no evidence for a god. We've got the laws of physics, and we're going to just press forward under the assumption that physics is all there is until the clouds part and God reveals him or herself or itself to us. And at that point, we may change our tune. It was not one note. I was the only person who had that perspective in the room. Everybody else was coming at religion from a very different way of thinking about the world. In fact, there's one Nobel laureate in the room who got up and sang psalms as part of his presentation. And I was sitting there and I was like, what is happening here? This is so unexpected to me. And what it really meant was I was so close-minded into the varieties of religious engagement that happen in the world. It doesn't convert me. I haven't changed my views on whether or not there is a God, but it has changed my views on the value of a religious sensibility, the role that it plays in people's lives, that for some individuals, it gives a connection to a historical lineage that's deeply valued. For some individuals, it puts their life in a larger setting that allows them to be in the world in a more productive way. So there are a whole range of roles that religious engagement can play. The problem is when you start to pit it against scientific insight, then you run into trouble. But religion was never developed to give us factual information about the world. Religion will never give us the electron magnetic moment to nine decimal places, that's the purview of scientific investigation. And if you can keep these straight in your mind, there's a definite and powerful role for uh, a religious sensibility in the world. Yeah, I've, I feel like it gives people in a lot of ways a scaffolding for ethics and morality and allows them some alleviation of anxiety. Yeah, exactly. Some, a feeling of purpose. Is, but like you said, as long as it's not conflicting with rigid scientific reality. Yeah, like right. Like scientific, provable scientific reality. Yeah, and I got to tell you, it's a funny thing. You know, Richard Dawkins, I don't know, have I've you had, had him on here. the program? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you know that his um, – his M.O. in the world is very anti-religious. I, yes. I think he would agree with me on that. I don't want to put words into his mouth. Um, but um, I did an event with him in New York, uh, uh, the Beacon Theater. Uh, I don't know. It was maybe a year ago or something like that. And it was very interesting because in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, his views were very similar to to mine, I, I felt, I mean, look, we don't agree in totality, but I was saying to him, there are times I go around the world and I will do things that are utterly irrational. I'll knock on wood for good luck. I'll speak to my dead father. I know that he's not really there. I'll pray to God on occasion if I think that I could use that backup. Not because I think there's some bearded individual in the sky. It's just a behavioral tendency that I find to be comforting and useful. And I said this to Richard. And he said, I totally get it. I was like, what? He was like, I totally get it. He said, he said in fact, 
He said, I don't like to sleep in a house that has a reputation as being haunted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, and, and, and for me, it was such a beautiful human moment. It was such a beautiful human moment where we were just like being human beings. Right. And, and he said, and then he said, we're both sinners. And I agree. We are yeah. both sinners in that sense <laughs> because we know how the world works. We know this doesn't make any sense. And yes, it's still part of somehow uh, how we behave in the world. And I think there's a value to recognizing that that is what it means to be human. Human. You will engage in the world in ways that are not necessarily strictly adhering to some rational perspective of how the scientific world operates. I would love to see Richard Dawkins outside of a haunted house yeah, saying, right. I'm not going in <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh. Uh, yeah. So, so. Yeah, there's something about creativity that it doesn't necessarily have to abide by any laws of logic yeah. and it can still be beneficial. Yeah. And that to me establishes that the notion that language is the only way that we can know about the world. You know, Wittgenstein had this mm -hmm. perspective and that the limits of my language, limits of my world, that seems to me utterly wrong. I mean, the experience of music reveals things about the world that I think are, are beyond linguistic. You can talk religion with a really intelligent person who's objective, who has a belief. It's, it's such an interesting subject because it's – it requires suspension of disbelief yeah. in order to absorb some of the stories. But there is clearly a history behind this of thousands of years of translations. Yeah. And yeah. you're trying to get to the what did they mean when they wrote this down? And yeah. How much did they know? And what were they trying to do? Were they just trying to get everybody to calm down and stay in line? Right. Or were they trying to find some means of gluing the group together yes. by a shared belief? Yes. Yeah. Or, you know, there are folks who basically say that there are qualities of the human brain that naturally leave it open to a religious sensibility. Yeah. Uh, so I think you're absolutely right. Having a conversation with somebody who has a religious perspective is deeply interesting. Yes. To understand where that mind came to the place that it got to. And from a personal sensibility, I give you, you know, I, I just give you one little anecdote. You know, my dad died. I was 23 years old. And uh, unexpectedly, I'd been visiting home. Oh, I was at Harvard at the time. I was visiting from Cambridge, and we had a nice weekend. And by the time I got back to Cambridge on the bus, my mom called me and said, Dad's dead. It was so, so shocking. It was like so sudden. It was so complete. And I remember I went back home, and my dad was not a religious man, but we knew that he would want to have a religious ceremony, and, and, we, and we did it. And we had, you know, a minion of Jews coming to the house to recite the, the Kaddish prayer, because we weren't religious. We didn't know what we were doing, you know. And I had no idea what these men were saying, but it was deeply comforting. In fact, I didn't want to know what they were saying. To me, it was just a collection of ancient sounds, but the sounds connected me across the generations to a culture that had been extending back 5,000 years. And in a moment of crisis, that was a very comforting and useful connection to have.